Hello and welcome to this in-depth look at the latest developments that are spurring the commercial growth of LNG as a marine fuel. My name is Craig Eason and I'm the Deputy Editor of Lloyd's List. Over the course of this broadcast, we will aim to offer new and direct insight regarding how owners, fuel suppliers, ports and other stakeholders are forging ahead and answering their own questions as market leaders. This thought leadership webinar has been developed with our webinar partner Shell, but we also have expert insights for you from within the shipping industry. The use of LNG as marine fuel is no longer news. There are a growing number of vessels already in service using this marine fuel and many more on order. We will hear a little bit about the demand side, but also the solutions for committed supply. It was probably a year ago that the industry really stopped talking about the chicken and egg scenario of whether supply, and by that we mean infrastructure, or the demand, that's ship owners committing to LNG conversions or new builds, should be first. Shipping is an industry where coming second in the race to the goal is often seen as a winning strategy. The technology for the industry to use LNG as a marine fuel has been brought to the market and is being used. Just as more ships are being built, so more ports are looking to build their own LNG bunker supply capabilities. This picture looks impressive and adds to this the vessels that will soon be in service to add to the existing fleet of gas-powered ships. The question is more about when should owners take this option seriously, not if. During this webinar, we will have short comments from our expert panel, whose details you will find on this portal. After the presentations, we will have a short roundtable session where I will initiate some questions, and you as listener can compose your own thoughts and questions and submit them in on the online tool provided on your screen. And after the roundtable, I'll be able to ask the panelists your questions. Our first panelist is Henning Moan, a Principal Advisor at the Classification Society and Marine Advisory DNV GL Group. Over the past six years, he's been assessing the implications of new maritime emissions regulations, along with the use of LNG as a marine fuel, and has ample practical experience from DNV GL and previous employers covering both new build and retrofit installations, installation management, commissioning, training and support. Henning. Thank you. LNG fuel started with small ferries, but it's now also considered as fuel for huge container ships and bunkers and, and uh, bulk ships. This is very interesting and demonstrates that under the right circumstances, LNG is a safe fuel and LNG is plentiful available. LNG is an efficient answer to upcoming ship emission regulations with 0.10% sulfur limit inside aircraft from next year, 0.5% limit in EU from 2020, and 0.5% sometime after 2020 enforced by the IMO. LNG fuel solution is further developed uh, than many other low emission alternatives like, for instance, biofuel. In order to develop LNG infrastructure further, we now see interesting initiatives between ship operators, gas companies, and logistics providers. Interestingly, we often see LNG being priced being competitive over conventional fuels. What started with a subsidized LNG ferry in Norway 15 years ago has now massively developed to a fleet of 50 sailing LNG fuel ships and 69 ships on order. The USA, Canada, and North Europe will get most of these ships, but there is a very interesting development in the Eastern Hemisphere as well. The new LNG fuel ships are no longer only small ferries and offshore vessels. Very large LNG fuel container ships and bulk carriers are also being considered. In addition to the ships shown here, there are several inland waterway vessels and LNG bunker ships available, and more are under construction. The design of LNG fuel ships still follow IMO's so-called interim guidelines, but a new code for gas fuel ships is expected to be enforced in 2017. There are numerous supporting documents for operation and classification of LNG fuel ships here under ISO guidelines for LNG bunkering and LNG sampling. Dominant class society now also have rules for LNG fuel ships, a work started by Legacy DNV more than 10 years ago. DNVGL has also launched a recommended practice for LNG bunkering. Interesting news this year is the recent launch of SGMF, the Society for Gas as a Marine Fuel. 
detailed sterilization of bunkering procedures and physical interfaces are still missing, though. With high ECA sailing time, LNG fueled ships can be financially attractive for ship owners. This chart uh, shows that even though an LNG fuel installation requires a higher upfront investment than scrubbers or outfitting engines for using low sulfur fuel, the overall economy of the LNG solution will be beneficial for many owners over time due to the lower comparable fuel costs. The global LNG fuel knowledge base is steadily growing uh, with the harmonization of procedures and regulation, risk assessments, LNG fuel chain logistics, and a so-called LNG ready fuel service uh, being launched. Now it's time to get more clarity for costs and design for LNG supply chains and a global harmonization of LNG bunker operations. Further, the price point of LNG delivered to the LNG fuel ships is in general not very well understood by owners and operators and causes confusion for parties willing to invest in LNG fuel ships. Thank you, Henning. One of the key components today for operators in securing the future of an LNG-powered vessel will be the relationship with the fuel supplier. Shell has been working hard in placing itself as one of the market leaders in LNG fuel supply. Our next panelist, Lauren Vettermans, is responsible for downstream LNG business with Shell. He joined Shell in 1995 and is leading the group's effort focusing on the business development of LNG as a new fuel for transport, as well as stationary applications. Lauren. Thank you very much, Craig. At Shell, we recognize the challenges for the maritime sector. These are challenges that we face in our own operations as well. If we look at the implementation of the ECAS, we already start seeing an impact on supply and demand for overall bunker fuels. We already start seeing people um, having to make choices uh, for the alternatives that are available. The bigger impact will come with MARPLE 6 implementation. Whilst there are alternatives for different segments, uh, we do see real advantages for LNG to establish itself as a bunker fuel for the next generation of ships. LNG is no longer a concept, but really become a reality. Gas is a credible, cost competitive, and what we see, a cleaner burning fuel. If we look at the challenges, there are a number of building blocks already in place. If we take engine technology, um, the offer uh, in the market across the different power ranges uh, is already um, uh, quite ample and improving every day. If we look at the regulatory aspects, um, the developments, and uh, if we can note Rotterdam uh, as an example, already help us to shape uh, regulation not only here, but it's also um, a basis for discussion in uh, a number of the other markets that's where uh, we're working on. What we do see is that it does require a unique partnership and a collaborative effort across that value chain with the different parties involved, and I'm glad to have many of those partners on the call today. If we look at infrastructure as one of the other challenges, we are tackling that head-on and in line with how we see demand develop. And we recently made a big investment in Rotterdam that I'll talk to in a second. The other uh, component in terms of making LNG a credible fuel is, um, is the supply side. Um, at Shell, uh, we, uh, we have been a pioneer in LNG. Uh, we've been involved from the inception 50 years ago uh, with the uh, first commercial plant started up in Algeria. Um, we have one of the most diverse LNG portfolios, and we've got access to uh, strategic markets in Asia, Pacific, and North America. We're involved across the entire uh, value chain in gas exploration, production, in shipping LNG, and um, uh, we now see um, the extension of that business to uh, make LNG available in the maritime sector. As highlighted by DNV, um, for LNG to become a credible fuel, we need uh, a network, and then we need a network that um, ultimately covers uh, global demands. That's where uh, the real challenges are. Today we see uh, a network being developed uh, or that is already effective in, um, in, um, in the Nordics, um, making it available for global, um, global maritime sector requires us to develop um, LNG around the key bunkering hubs in the world. Um, developing this and starting this in, um, in Rotterdam, uh, 
helps us to make LNG uh, a, a reliable and safe uh, fuel that we can also uh, make available in other markets. So whilst we start in Rotterdam, we're, um, we're actively um, looking at making it available in the U.S., Europe, but thereafter uh, in the Middle East and uh, Far East as well to make sure that there is a global coverage um, around those key hubs. So as I said, um, moving on to the next uh, slide, um, as I said, Rotterdam um, is one of the key examples that we've worked on. We have worked very hard to de-risk that LNG journey and unlock the supply chain for customers. We started by leveraging the experience that we gained in Gasnor. Ten years of bunkering experience, more than 60,000 transfers uh, have happened and recognizing that we need to take this to the next level. That's why we made the commitment in Rotterdam, together with Vopak, with Gazini, with the Port of Rotterdam, to actually unlock LNG as a bunker fuel by investing in a small-scale break bulk facility. That facility will be operational in 2016, but it already allows us to start bunkering and to, uh, to already offer LNG as a bunker fuel today in that port. The other key point raised earlier was uh, that we need clarity on LNG pricing. The changing regulate, uh, regulatory environment causes um, quite a bit of uncertainty around where uh, all the different fuel prices are going. LNG uh, brings uh, yet another dimension into that. With the investments in LNG, ship owners and charters are looking to de-risk their investments. If we look at the alternatives uh, that are available in the market, uh, moving primarily to uh, gas oil as the uh, key alternative, we will offer LNG at a discount to uh, a gas oil marker. That allows um, the ship owner to lock in a differential against um, what the competition is doing and will provide certainty around the investment, certainty around the, um, uh, the payback period, that people are looking for in order to uh, to make that investment. In our view, the developments are uh, pointing into the right direction. With regard to infrastructure, uh, we can see that uh, demand is uh, helping us to make choices around where we want to invest, and uh, we see developments both in Europe and in the U.S. already unlocking today. Uh, what we now need to do is maintain that traction around uh, around demand and create that tipping point uh, to make LNG into a mainstream offering uh, in the long term. With that, Craig, I would like to give it back to you. Thank you very much. Our next panelist offering thoughts on how LNG will develop as a competitive fuel choice is Bas Hennison, the Port of Rotterdam's Vice President of Industry and Bulk Cargo. The Port of Rotterdam is the largest in Europe, ranked fourth largest in the world. And Mr. Hennison is responsible for the commercial LNG fuel supply option for vessels that are going to be calling at the port. Baz? Thank you very much, Craig. Uh, we're proud to present the status of the uh, development of the LNG market in the port of Rotterdam. Uh, we've been involved now for some years and are very happy with the results. And one important success factor, as we see it, is the collaborations of partners along the chain. Um, our ambition in the port of Rotterdam is to develop from gate to hub um, uh, for the fuel market, uh, and such an ideal hub would consist of an LNG import terminal gate, which was just mentioned by uh, Laurent, but also export facilities like truck loading and the brake bulk terminal for loading smaller vessels uh, for supplying remote industries, and of course all the facilities to supply LNG to the bunker and fuel markets. Uh, for the port of Rotterdam, uh, the bunker market is uh, critical. Uh, we are the third largest bunker market in the world, and we also want to offer clean bunker alternatives to the shipping industry uh, next to normal conventional bunkers in the years to come. And that is important uh, because, as was just mentioned by Shell and DNV, um, the regulations are going to change. Uh, there's going to be some pressure on high sulfur fuels, um, so it's important for us as Port of Rotterdam to be able to offer the choice available. Um, now, I'm happy to say that a number of goals uh, are already realized. Um, starting next month, the port will construct the basin, the port basin, and the key wall for the brake bulk terminal just mentioned uh, by Laurent. Um, we have already been bunkering inland barges since 2011 in Rotterdam in our Seine haven, 
And we're also working very hard with parties in the market to develop uh, bunker vessels for the port of Rotterdam. Our port bylaws uh, were adapted uh, in July 2014, uh, and we are now the only port in the world that allows ship-to-ship bunkering for LNG officially. Um, We have developed incentive schemes for in-navigation called Green Awards. Uh, We have maritime incentive schemes called Environmental Ship Indexes, all aimed at giving reduction in on port use for clean ships. And we're also uh, co-coordinating a large European funded program for the advancement of LNG as a fuel. Um, total project is about 80 million euros uh, with funding from the EU of about 40 million. And a lot of partners are working in this project together with us. Uh, to give you an example, in June, company Danzer baptized a retrofit container vessel called the Eiger Nordwand. Uh, and in September, Camgas baptized an LNG-driven tanker called the Sirocco. Um, and also, uh, uh, a while ago, uh, the company VSL decided to start a calibration center for LNG in the port of Rotterdam. And the company Falk opened the first training center for emergency response for LNG in Northwest Europe. So a lot of objectives has already been uh, been met. Um, our way forward is to also uh, start working globally on LNG uh, in order to make a full supply chain, as was just mentioned by Cell globally. We need to make sure everybody uses the same standards. So we're work- working very hard on developing an international network for LNG bunker facilities. Uh, we formed strategic alliances with a number of partners in order to advance the market of LNG as a fuel. Uh, to start in the Netherlands, we have developed a national LNG platform, which is a cooperation between industry and government to remove hurdles and strengthen opportunities, for example, in the area of taxes and duties. And we're very happy to see that also in Germany now an LNG platform has been established. Uh, in Europe, we uh, have a cooperation with the inland ports of Mannheim uh, and the ports in Switzerland in order to dev- develop guidelines for ports and emergency response situations with respect to LNG. Uh, we have a cooperation with the port of Gothenburg in order to make LNG bunkering possible in both ports. Uh, we're working together with the safety guideline expertise of all port authorities in Europe uh, to develop those uh, uh, guidelines further. And globally, we uh, are working with uh, a so-called focus group consisting of the ports of Singapore, Rotterdam, Seebrugge, and Antwerp to harmonize global standards uh, in the world, so to allow the setup of a global supply chain. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Baz. Now, while we've heard a little bit about the, um, the development of the, uh, the fuel supply side of this uh, developing industry and there is some general agreement that the technology has reached a level of maturity that um, almost any vessel we heard a number already could be built to run off of LNG however there are some continued developments that are making some of these processes um, strengthened and move forward our next uh, participant is Magnus Meermoys He's Vice President for Integrated Solutions at Vartzilla, and uh, he's going to lead us now into looking at some of the more technology solutions. Magnus? Thank you, Craig. Ships are today complex machines, and to meet future needs in shipping, technology, new technology can be leveraged to create new vessel specifications that meet the current and particularly future business needs in shipping. And when complexity increases, integration is of course the key. Vertila has taken a position to try to collect knowledge areas to a sufficient degree to support our customers in the shipping sectors with the necessary level of integration capabilities. Having worked about 10 years or more in uh, in the sector of gas fuel vessels, we have noted that the challenges that our customers uh, prioritize or or list as high up on their challenge uh, agendas have slightly shifted. 
initially it was very much about the availability of LNG, but as we have heard today, there are major developments uh, going on in the key places uh, along shipping routes to debottleneck this, and, and I would say the availability of LNG is no longer the primary concern uh, considering using natural gas in shipping. However, there are challenges that remain. For example, uh, additional investment costs and the impact on OPEX, operational costs, which can be a positive impact in some, but of course, an area that is of, that doesn't have similar predictability as traditional bunker markets. And also, with new technology, the profile of competence areas may be changing. We have focused on trying to make uh, coping with new technology as easy as possible. And one of the ways that we have uh, addressing this is to package integrated solutions for LNG storage and LNG handling on board the ships. So this new technology area that is introduced once the fuel is changed to a new fuel is then made as easy as possible by, by having an integrated solution. Um, on this journey, we have also then taken continuous steps and earlier this year we launched the next version of this LNG pack uh, solution which simplifies the system and incorporates functions uh, integral into the system to reduce the cost of construction, uh, better utilize the space on board the vessel for commercial purposes and so forth. So this is still a possibility to improve these systems. When we look at early adopters of LNG as a fuel, we find them in particular niches of shipping and uh, the experience in, in the early adopter niches stretches for more than 10 years. So there's quite a good reference uh, base already in terms of what does LNG as a fuel mean for the operational shipping. And what we can see is that the early adopters seem to have been able to gain first mover advantages uh, by applying LNG as a fuel in their particular business segment, either in the form of higher day rates or in the form of lower operating costs, or in many cases at least in the sense that to gain a preferred position when competing uh, with peers in their sector for, for charters. Now it can be assumed that a similar first mover advantages can be also be gained in any other shipping segment and the evidence of that is already there. Drilling into trying to find out concrete benefits, some analysis to specific cases brings out quite interesting data. For example, that by introducing new technology, new vessel specifications, uh, as in this analyzed case, being a passenger vessel, that the passenger growth uh, was seen, seen positive. Passenger quantity and market share. Now, you can imagine that if you can serve, bring on board 183,000 passengers more over the first year of operation, it also gives you the possibility to capture business benefits from serving those customers on board and creating additional revenue, not only through ticket sales, but also through the services offered on board. And this then seen in increased uh, net sales revenue of quite significant amount. And then the icing on the cake to see also recognition of the achievements uh, through uh, internationally uh, recognized awards. And I think this is an uh, example now, just to pick one, that gives us uh, the support to claim that adopting LNG into shipping can be the driver for successful business strategies in shipping.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Magnus. Next, we have Hans Weaverberg, Gas Operations Manager for Evergas in Denmark. He's here to explain the considerations the company had for building a series of LNG-fueled gas carriers for transatlantic service. Hans. Okay, thanks, Greg. Um, so, indeed, Evergas is currently building a series of ships for Ineos. Uh, these are eight multigas ships uh, for the transport of ethane uh, shale gas from U.S. to uh, two places in EU, which are uh, Grangemouth and Raffness, and we sourced the ethane out of Marcus Hook and Houston. And as you can see on the map, well, it, it may be not so clear, but we will have considerable time in emission-controlled areas, uh, wherefore we, we, at the start of this project, we were looking at how best to comply with the uh, current and future regulations, uh, so for the, uh, so the SOX, the NOX, and the CO2, and uh, having looked at all the options like uh, low sulfur fuels, scrubs, etc., uh, we have uh, decided to offer LNG uh, possibilities, LNG burning and, and, and therefore dual fuel engine uh, capacity. The ships have a uh, total capacity of around 30,000 cubic meters with uh, 27,500 cubic meters cargo tanks and two times 1,000 cubic meters LNG fuel tanks on deck. As far as we know, these will be the first deep-sea uh, trading ships with gas-burning capacity, uh, set aside from the, 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 the classical LNG tankers. Um, and we have had a lot of interest from, from several LNG suppliers, of course, because this, this offers them a chance to really justify the investment of uh, their LNG uh, supply chain. Um, indeed, we would be needing quite a lot of LNG, and uh, therefore we have discussed the, the, this supply with many potential suppliers, both in uh, Europe, um, in Scandinavia and era, area, and in U.S., both uh, near Philadelphia and the U.S. Gulf. So as I said, the ships will indeed spend quite some time in these emission control areas, and the solution was then to to equip the ships with Wartzela dual fuel main engines and auxiliary engines for the power generation, and uh, also two shaft generators. All in all, this offers in EOS a lot of flexibility and redundancy which was required. Uh, so we, we are able to run on one main engine. We are able to run a main engine in the port as a, as a power, for power generation uh, through the shafts. So all in all, it, it, uh, it's a very interesting ship. What else? The LNG dual fuel possibility offers us a chance to uh, not only shift between heavy fuel and uh, gas oil and LNG when required, but we can, of course, also uh, source the LNG both at the U.S. and the EU side, uh, wherefore we have uh, discussed potential offer on both sides of the ocean. For us, it's very important not to be burdened with the full supply chain investment uh, just because we are kind of a first mover, which is why we are negotiating hard with any potential supplier and trying to... Um, uh, trying to repeat a little bit the, 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 the classical HFO or a marine gas oil supply chain. So we, we are looking for flexibility in our contract. We don't know what, what's going to happen with prices in the future. So we are trying to have as much flexibility as we can, both in volumes and, and time. Uh, so for the moment, we are evaluating all these offers, and we hope to soon uh, start concluding a few deals uh, on either side of the ocean. And that's it, I think. Thank you very much, Hans. And thank you to all of the panelists. Before I continue, a reminder for all of those listening to this webinar live that you can ask your questions by using the window in the web portal that you're connected to. We're going to host a roundtable discussion now. Um, I'm just going to raise some of the questions that spring to mind as we were listening to the presentations. And I'm going to address my first question, if I may, to Lauren. 
Um, from Shell's perspective, um, what do you think are going to be the key differences that ship owners will see in securing LNG fuel supply compared to how they've secured their bunkers um, traditionally? Thanks, Craig. I think the key difference uh, is already clear that uh, whilst today you can expect bunker fuel to be available in any port, what we're looking um, uh, at at the moment is that um, we're seeing much more earlier involvement uh, and joint collaboration around uh, building that infrastructure. Uh, it's not a question of um, of how, but it's a question of when and where to develop that uh, together. So uh, it's a question of uh, uh, earlier involvement, uh, a stronger commitment from both parties, and therefore a collaborative uh, partnership that sets it apart from what today's bunker fuels offer. That is something that is an exciting journey. Um, it does require some more work, but um, it helps us to de-risk um, the development of that infrastructure uh, for all parties involved. Okay, thank you. And Henning, from DNVGL's perspective, where do you see the LNG fitting into the future fuel mix? You've, at DNVGL, you've examined the future scenarios, and I just wondered if you could in, um, offer some thoughts about where LNG will really fit compared to what's being used or what could be used in the future. Yeah, thank you, Craig. Um, yeah, we have been examining the potential uh, markets in both the Far East and Europe and also in America, and so in general, the ideal case for LNG fuel is for new build ships uh, spending much of the operation time in ECAS, having owners with long-term uh, ownership and preferably paying for the fuel themselves and operating in quite predictable uh, patterns so they get uh, hold on LNG when they need. But we do see also other niches uh, where LNG fuel can fit in. Uh, there can be uh, niche cases uh, where the charter has access to ample uh, amounts of natural gas and there can also be remote areas uh, where they need uh, LNG as, as a more energy source for islands and so on. But of course, there are owners who don't find uh, the upfront capex uh, investment uh, too attractive, so they would prefer other solutions, say as, uh, choosing low sulfur distillates, so one of these uh, new uh, low sulfur heavy fuel oils uh, being introduced to the markets. And also many owners will choose uh, scrubbers, which has, uh, in general, a lower upfront investment. But over time, you are paying a penalty for, uh, say, fuel, uh, extra fuel use and so on. So I think this is a, a discussion that has gone on for quite some time. It is not a straight answer, but it's very much up to the ship owner's perspective and also up to the ship configuration to choose the right fuel uh, for the future. But definitely LNG will be uh, with there, but there will also be other fuels uh, which will be preferred by owners. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Baz, from the Port of Rotterdam, you, you, you touched on the, the need for harmonization or standards for infrastructure with other ports. Is this something that's going to work quite well? How is this going to be achieved and what sort of standards were you talking about? Uh, thank you, Craig. Um, yeah, like I said uh, in my presentation, uh, for us it's very important to be able to offer all the potential fuels uh, for our shipping companies uh, that are available. Um, it only makes sense if they can uh, uh, have the same fuel mix in other ports, uh, and especially for the global container trade, there are only a few mega hubs uh, where uh, these uh, ships dock, uh, for example, Rotterdam, Singapore, Shanghai, uh, but also in the U.S., uh, so it's key that all those uh, ports use the same regulation, use the same technical standards. Um, now, on the technical standards, I think a lot of work has been done. Uh, on the port regulations, um, uh, that's still uh, under development. Um, and since we have already uh, adapted our port bylaws and have established regulation in, uh, in Rotterdam, uh, we're very happy to share that with the other ports um, uh, in the world. Uh, to make sure they use the same sort of approach, uh, again, to enable our customers to uh, 
to bunker in the same way in all the ports globally. Uh, we see a lot of uh, activity on that front. Uh, I think all the major ports in the world see this as, a, as an upcoming fuel and they're very eager to work with us uh, and with the others together to establish these uh, global guidelines. Okay, thank you. Um, Magnus, at, at Vatsila, you mentioned in your presentation that there was a ferry operator that had seen increased passenger numbers. Um, these clearly show that there's more potential here than um, the environmental um, benefits and the potential to reduce your fuel bill, so to speak. Are, the, are these additional um, benefits uh, that you, you reference, are they going to be a realistic driver, a part of the driving mix to entice owners to look at LNG as a marine fuel? Yeah, thanks, Craig. Um, I think, as always with driving business strategies, there are multiple factors that come together in, in shaping that strategy. Certainly, sustainability uh, today has to be one of those cornerstones. Definitely, uh, economics has to be uh, and continue to be a, a cornerstone of, of any business strategy. But um, in highly competitive markets like shipping, uh, one has to seek uh, also, let's say, new angles to the business segment you're in. And uh, so I think these kind of uh, game changer elements will be part of successful uh, business strategies also in shipping going forward. So, so yes, to answer your question. Great. Thank you, Magnus. And my next question is going to be going to Hans Wieverberg from Evergas. Hans, you talked a little bit about arbitrage in the operations between the U.S. and Europe. Could you give me some more details about that, please? Sure, sure, Greg. Um, well, it is um, quite clear that uh, with the low Henry Hub prices of uh, natural gas in the U.S. and uh, the recent abundance of gas in the U.S. Um, and the potential exports to Asia um, on, the one ha on the one side of the ocean and the other side of the ocean where all LNG needs to be supplied from either, uh, well, from all over the world, which has a long, um, well, transport uh, time, that, of course, we believe that it could be cheaper to source LNG in the US, USA. Uh, on the other hand, we know that the small-scale LNG supply in Europe has been developed further. Um, so that's why we have, from the beginning, always looked at uh, both sides of the ocean, and, and we hope that uh, we will be able to uh, offer the most competitive uh, priced fuel to our customer uh, as we go, as the project uh, continues. Thank you, Hans. Uh, my next question, actually, I want to ask uh, Mr. Vettermans uh, from Shell. I see that you've just announced um, that you're going to build your own LNG bunker vessel uh, for operating in Rotterdam. Why do you think that this is uh, such a necessary move? That shows an element of um, competence on your part on the development of LNG as a fuel. Thanks, Greg, for the question. Um, yeah, we're very pleased to announce uh, today that we have uh, committed to build our own bunker vessel. We see this as a crucial element in uh, providing um, a safe and reliable and, a, and an efficient supply chain. Um, it was a, a missing element in a, a lot of the discussions. I think we've seen um, some movements uh, in the market, but um, we will now build uh, a vessel that will be available in Rotterdam that uh, will allow our customers to uh, experience a, um, a normal bunkering operation as they're used to. And I think that, um, that uh, provides further confidence uh, that um, the market is there, uh, that there will be a normal service, um, and um, uh, that uh, customers can, um, uh, can count on a secure supply chain. So for us, um, and I think for customers, this is going to be a, a very important um, further sign of the confidence 
um, that we have and that the market should have in LNG becoming a reality. Okay. Thank you very much, Steve. We've got a number of questions already coming in from participants listening to this webinar. And just a reminder that uh, at the bottom of your consoles, you'll see the Q&A tab. If you don't have the box for the um, asking a question pop-up, press the Q&A tab and you'll see your question box appear. And then you can type in your question to me and then I'll ask it uh, to the participants. As I said, we've got a number of questions coming in. Um, some of them are on common themes. Um, one of them that's come in is, or two of them that have come in so far, are relating to the competition against other fuel sources and the changing oil prices. I'd like to ask that, um, again, of Mr. Vetterman, um, from Shell's perspective, we see new fuels turning up, um, ultra-low sulfur, um, fuel oils, and we see the changing of fuel prices. Can you make any comments about whether these fuel prices may push back LNG development? The oil markets or the fuel markets are um, traditionally uh, volatile. So um, um, what we've uh, obviously experienced in the last three months um, is something that um, um, raises a lot of questions with people. Um, what we think is uh, important is that uh, we, we need to provide people a long-term um, perspective on how LNG is going to be priced. Um, so what we're looking at is uh, uh, selling that LNG um, marked and uh, linked to an oil alternative that gives people uh, a differential that uh, allows them to uh, make good on their investment, uh, secures a payback. Now, how th that then also helps them to manage the exposure to what these uh, prices are going to do in the market. Um, if we only knew how these prices were going to develop, we would obviously all be in a different, uh, different space. And therefore, it is important to provide that uh, level of security to uh, customers as they are moving um, to uh, a, different, uh, a different type of fuel. Thank you. Um, another couple of questions that have come in are relating to the locations of potential bunkering facilities. I'm going to ask Henning from DNV GL's perspective. You've done a number of studies looking at the expansion of LNG as a marine fuel. We've got some questions coming in from much further afield than uh, Europe here, asking about opportunities in the Middle East, in the Far East, um, and even in uh, North America. Can you make any comments, um, offer any thoughts about how we see the expansion of LNG bunkering facilities? Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I can comment in general terms. Uh, we do see companies almost worldwide now uh, looking at into opportunities uh, or running their numbers, business cases, for potentially establishing LNG bunkering worldwide. However, I think most, see most uh, realistic cases maybe are uh, those locations close to the echo zones. But still there are, say, niche markets, say, remote markets, remote islands, and so on, which also can be interesting. So I can't go too much into detail, but there are uh, interests in general around the globe now to, to understand this. Uh, for for shipping industry and also for small scale LNG development in general. So there's likely to be all of this um, development with um, LNG bunkering around the world, but we see a number of different sources of LNGs, and this is a, a theme that um, I've also heard addressed. I'm going to ask Magnus now from Vartzilla. We've got questions coming in about the LNG quality. Are there any issues to bear in mind in terms of the quality of the LNG that we're putting into the bunker tanks and using um, on ships? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, there is a requirement specification, as, uh, as is the, the, the norm with, with all types of fuels. Um, uh, but uh, in general, commercially available LNG qualities are, are possible to use. Um, and uh, typically the one thing to look out for is that in the value chain of LNG production and transport, the quantities of inerts, meaning uh, Inert, inert components that, that doesn't burn uh, as a fuel. But generally speaking, the variety of LNG is not that, that broad and, uh, and it's a good quality fuel. 
on the perspective of the port, Spaz, um, one of the questions that's come in is relating to ship owners actually changing their trading patterns. Um, should they find that there is no LNG available in a particular port. Are you, do you think that is likely? Do you think that you're going to attract customers because you're going to be at the forefront of, uh, of offering LNG in this changing market? That's a very interesting and intriguing uh, question, of course. Uh, we believe as one of the major bunker ports, we need to be able to offer all the possible available bunker fuels, uh, whether it be low sulfur or LNG. Uh, but since we are a forerunner on LNG, we, we do hope that this gives us a competitive edge. Uh, if LNG is available and priced competitively, uh, then it might be an opportunity to attract uh, cargo. Mm, thank, thank you. Um, one of the issues that you also alluded to um, during your presentation, Baz, was in, case, in issues of standards, and you alluded to FALC offering safety training um, within your facilities. Can you tell me anything about the level of training that uh, bunker barge um, workers may need to have or the level of sort of understanding and awareness that uh, you're going to be offering in the port facilities for those that are going to be handling LNG? Yes, this is of course a very new industry uh, in terms of bunkering. Uh, I think the LNG industry is already well established uh, and so is the training. Uh, but as we roll out the, uh, the bunker barges and the bunker facilities, more training is, is needed uh, coming from the experience uh, in the large LNG uh, uh, trading area. Uh, so with this training facility, uh, uh, I'm, I'm very confident that we will roll out the training uh, as we roll out the infrastructure in the future. And uh, within Evergas, hands at Evergas, what are you um, looking to do in terms of making your crews aware of um, the issues of LNG once you get your vessels operational? Well, we, we have... Um, in our advantage, we have a fleet, of course, uh, we are a gas-carrying company. Um, the ships will have LNG carrying capacity, so the crews will be familiar with the carriage of LNG. Um, we have uh, a lot of experience with cryogenic cargos uh, in ethylene, and um, so that's our advantage that we, we have crew that is, of course, already trained and certified to deal with uh, these kinds of uh, uh, fuels. I can imagine that for uh, container and bulk carriers, you, you will require uh, additional training. Do you feel that the, um, the level of training, we've got the, um, the, the various IMO codes that have been developed. I was wondering whether the, um, and there's a question coming in, whether the training is actually going to be um, robust enough. From DNVGL's perspective, I know you offer a lot of advice on the issues of, of safety. Um, has this become a pertinent issue from DNVGL's perspective? Uh, yes, indeed. It must be done safe. And, of course, we have been involved in some training, of course, over the last uh, 10, 15 years we've been involved in this, and we have developed some training material. Uh, but, of course, it eventually it's up to the flight states to, uh, to accept this. But we do see more harmonization in training. And also with the new IGF code, there's further harmonization of the training needs. So, of course, as was heard earlier today, it must be a quite uniform uh, knowledge base around, both on the ports and the bunkering stations, but also on board the vessels in order to uh, continue this as a safe industry when it now seems to move from say, short sea shipping and local transport to a more uh, deep sea uh, fashion of uh, shipping. So definitely this is something we will follow uh, up quite closely, I can assure you. But we also try to, to help the industry forward here. I'm going to stay with you briefly, um, Henning, because I've got a couple of questions that have come in relating to methanol and other alternative fuels that we see uh, being used, or not sorry, being used, but are, are certainly um, there are owners that are interested in using these. Um, what can you say about the sort of comparisons of LNG versus methanol and any of the other fuels that are currently being discussed? Ah, oh, that's a very interesting question, although I know more about LNG than methanol, but still uh, we do deal with methanol every now and then. Uh, methanol is, of course, available worldwide as a commodity, 
uh, but still it is uh, quite high price on it and the energy density is quite low so you need quite some big tanks with that but on the other side you don't need cryogenic uh, tanks and all these extra uh, safety devices so uh, so there also are plus sides to this uh, sometimes we see this is related to local industry, say in countries producing a lot of methanol. Of course, the natural would be to try to uh, figure out if methanol can be a nice fuel. So, of course, uh, we do think that LNG will come up further up on the, on the list of preferred alternative fuels than methanol. Thanks. Hans, uh, there's a specific question come up over your uh, decision to opt for dual fuel engines as opposed for pure gas engines. Can you um, explain a little bit about um, why you selected dual fuel and not went for pure gas engines, given that there could have been some um, capital cost savings had done so? Yeah, and that comes back to where I said that uh, we, could, uh, we could always offer the most competitive fuel to our clients and also ensure uh, that we have a fuel supply. At the time of the decision, um, it wasn't 100% clear yet how, how the U.S. market was going to evolve. So for us, it makes uh, a lot of sense to, to have that flexibility in, in, in fuel choice, and, uh, but at the same time be 100% sure that the ships can run. These vessels will, in effect, be kind of a floating pipeline, so the cargo needs to arrive at the discharge port, so we need to, I mean, we, we cannot take any risks there, so that's why we, we have chosen dual fuel engines. Okay, thank you. Um, another question that I'd like to actually put to uh, Lauren, if, if I may. The question has come in over relating to, actually it's more relating to, um, you've opted to use Rotterdam as a sort of distribution point because you've got the gate terminal there. Um, what do you think will be the sort of development scenario of standalone facilities um, around the world that won't necessarily be linked to distribution points or big import-export points uh, like the gate terminal? Right. We obviously have um, our uh, facilities uh, in Norway through Gaznor uh, that are currently uh, operating and they're linked to uh, the supply out of Norway. Um, the way that we see it develop is on the back of uh, existing infrastructure and then uh, through hub and spoke models uh, developing uh, the secondary ports. What we have done is um, a quite an extensive uh, research in um, the current uh, trades uh, that exist, so what are the shipping lanes, what is the bunkering patterns of um, uh, the uh, ocean-going fleets, um, um, and in the different um, uh, regional waters, so in the ECAS, for example. And so uh, we have determined our priorities as to where we want to develop. That actually has a very good match with, um, with the existing um, existing infrastructure, and that's what we want to leverage. Um, as demand builds out, we will then see the development of uh, some of the uh, secondary ports as well. Okay, thank you. A question now, again, to the Port of Rotterdam, to Baz. Um, There's a question coming in about uh, the, the bylaws that you had to adjust. Um, could you give some details about what it was on the bylaws that you had to um, adapt to make LNG bunkering a possibility in the port? Yes, thanks for the question. Well, uh, I think the simplest reason is there was no bylaw for uh, uh, LNG bunkering because it didn't exist. So uh, the first bylaw we adjusted last year is to allow uh, truck-to-ship bunkering, uh, which is what we are currently doing with, uh, with barges. Um, and last uh, few months ago, we allowed ship-to-ship uh, -ship, uh, uh, bunkering for LNG. Um, and the bylaws basically state uh, where that can happen in the port, uh, under which circumstances, uh, what the uh, safety zones are, um, and uh, some of the uh, the permit uh, permits around that. So it's it's all the practical uh, things that need to be arranged in order to allow for that uh, bunkering. Um, but we basically had to build that up from uh, from scratch. Okay, thank you. A question for Magnus here. There's a question um, relating to new builds versus retrofitting. We see a lot of new building orders that are coming in at the moment. Um, 
Retrofitting doesn't seem to be um, such a, a strong part of this LNG discussion at the moment. Do you think it will remain that way? Do you think um, LNG compares poorly against scrubbers and distillate fuel when it comes to the existing fleet for, com for uh, compliance with regulations? Yeah, I think that's uh, it's a very case-specific uh, conclusions that have to be made on, on particular vessels, uh, their age, their trading pattern, uh, their ownership, and of course the technical um, uh, complexity of, of making such an, uh, such an upgrade, meaning that also the, the starting point has to be established what, what's in that vessel. Um, and, and I also say ownership from the point of view that uh, uh, in some cases it makes, you know, it becomes fleet decisions rather than vessel decisions. Um, we do see a steady stream of conversions, uh, and as you pointed out, in, in a lower quantity than, than new builds. So it seems to be that the market is shaping towards that when it comes to new assets, uh, it's a more straightforward decision process, whereas for conversions, there are many, many more factors that have to be have to be weighed in, including the the, uh, the point in the in the economical life cycle the vessel uh, happens to be in at that point. Thank you, uh, Hans. A quick question has come in for you. Could you um, say what the uh, the fuel tanks are going to be on your new builds? Sure, that's uh, two times uh, Type C tanks, thousand cubic meters uh, LNG tanks. Um, and they are connected to the cargo system, so we could either bunker through dedicated bunker lines or um, if we would need to go to a large-scale terminal or something, we could connect it directly through the cargo system and fill up the tank uh, in that way. So it's Type-C tanks. Type-C tanks. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Um, and I I think we've got time for um, just one or two more questions before we close this uh, live webinar. Um, and there's one coming in in terms of the sort of expansion of the market, and this is, I think, more directed towards Lauren of Shell. Have you put any sort of timestamps on how you think the market for LNG is likely to, to develop? Obviously, the, the ECAs are important, so uh, with the uh, European ECA coming into force on the 1st of January, that will start um, seeing uh, a stronger uh, demand um, that we can um, uh, see materialize here. Um, so the ECAs, Europe and the U.S., uh, Marple 6 will be another uh, important uh, uh, point for us to see uh, the development uh, pick up. Uh, we're keeping uh, a close eye on the signals and signposts um, around um, how this is being picked up um, through new builds. Uh, we've got, um, and uh, I think it's been corroborated by a, a lot of other external um, uh, sources, um, uh, we've got a perspective on how that demand is going to uh, develop. It's, it's going to take time, but I do think that um, there are a number of game changes that could actually uh, help um, uh, create some speed here. Uh, what is important for customers uh, to see is that uh, the, the supply chain is there, that it, um, that it works and that it um, uh, provides them a safe and reliable uh, service. Once we've uh, got that in place, you'll see that the development will be uh, going much quicker. Okay. Thank you. And just uh, one final question, a very specific one that I saw came up, and uh, I think I'll ask this of uh, Henning Moen at DNVGL. It's, um, if you take a 16,000 or 18,000 TU vessel as an example, what size would you expect the LNG bunker tank to be if that vessel was on Asia to Europe trade um, and you assume the traditional way of, bunker in, of bunkering on those trades, namely um, Rotterdam and Singapore? Well, it's quite specific questions. Uh, top of my head, around maybe 7,000 cubic meters or something. It depends a little bit if you want to bunker for the round trip or have enough or just to bunker in either port. So probably you need 7,000 or something. But, yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you very much. And it just um, 
leaves me to thank all of our participants on this um, webinar today uh, for their in input. That's uh, Lauren from Shell, Hans from Evergas, Henning from DNVGL, Baz from the Port of Rotterdam, and Magnus from Varsila. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, for all, uh, everybody who has um, or is currently listening, thank you for listening and thank you for all of your questions that you have submitted. In about an hour or so, the whole recording will be available for on-demand listening and reviewing. So you'll be able to listen to the presentations and the questions and answers again um, after that time. It leaves me now just to say thank you very much and have a nice day.